So let me kick off our next uh, panel discussion. We're going to be talking about cold chain and the opportunities for halal certified food products and production in this space. And with me on this um, panel, I've got uh, Yokoyama-san, who works for the Halal Media Company Japan Limited. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Yoko-san used to live back in um, live in Singapore and moved back to Japan recently, just in time for the Tokyo Olympics. So well done, good planning there. Um, we've also got Kunal Gupta, based in Dubai, and he's presently a specialist in food, beverage, supply chain management and procurement. And he heads the global supply chain for Batil Group, which has operations in over 11 countries from the US to the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And last but not least is a good um, friend and supporter of the Logistics Society, Mr. Michael Seymour, who's the Vice President and Managing Director for the Asia Pacific region at Rome B. Um, Michael is also an active member of the Executive Committee of the Logistics and Supply Chain Management Society. So with that, thank you very much and welcome, gentlemen. And great to have you all on the panel. Thank you. All right. Um, to kick us off, uh, just a bit of an icebreaker, Yoko-san. Uh, given your background, what started you or piqued your interest in halal or halal food products? Maybe you can share that with us. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity back to FIFB. Since I talked, uh, I delivered a talk in 2016. I'm very glad to be back here. Um, I'm Yokoyama, a co-founder of Food Diversity Incorporated. Previous name was Halal Media Japan Corporation Limited. Since I have stayed in Singapore for 10 years in total until 2018, I have many Muslim friends there who I would love them to bring to my beautiful mother country. So uh, that is my interest on the, the halal industry since, the, since 2014. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yoko-san. So what exactly are you doing in this space? You've renamed your organization. So what are you doing in the halal certified food products space? Okay, yes, it, I'm working on the two main fields. One is I run a media company called Food Diversity Today, which provides the diverse food information in Japan, like halal, veggie, vegan, and others. The second one is consulting services. I'm working on the many government agencies like uh, JETRO uh, the, and the local government bodies and even the universities. I'm a kind of the consultant to how to teach them how to cater to the people, how to cater the food to the guests who have the food restrictions visiting to Japan. Okay, and, and I'm assuming it's a growing area, obviously, yes? Yeah, exactly. Okay. The, um, Switching to you, Kunal, um, you know, the halal supply chain is very diverse. Yeah? Um, I did some work a few years ago in Indonesia, where they were even talking about halal um, refrigerators, halal appliances, uh, medical technology devices, etc., etc. So it's a very diverse, um, and there's even some dissimilarities, say, between Malaysia and Indonesia, right? So... What do you see as the main differences, if any, and in terms maybe opportunities as well, between the halal food supply chain in Asia versus the Middle East or even Africa, since you're opportunistically based in Dubai? Yeah, thank you, Raymond. Yeah, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and afternoon, actually. So, yeah, as uh, <clears throat> Raymond mentioned, I had supply chain for Batil. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, date production and sales organization and we are probably the only one that deals in luxury dates so coming basically starting from my current area of expertise which is food now based out of middle east the biggest difference i kind of figure out between asia middle east and africa would be you know this this whole the the difference in the geography and you know the demographics now middle east 
by virtue of obviously having a, a majority of muslim population the halal certification becomes more like you know a mandate i mean i, I remember being in singapore you have two sides of a food court you know that halal side and the non halal side while in dubai obviously or in the whole region there is no non halal side yeah, so it's 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 the only one side same for supermarket i mean there are very few supermarkets in the country where actually there is a small non halal section but otherwise imagine 95 98% of a supermarket is all halal so that's that's the kind of spread i'm trying to point out in terms of difference that you have when it comes to this region and that that makes it not only interesting but also very challenging so as you mentioned halal is now going much more than just food i mean it's it's so halal i mean of course traditionally halal used to be more to do with the the method of slaughter when it comes to the animal product but now it's become more to do with level of safety to avoid cross contamination you know and so on and so forth so it's it's more more like it's become a mindset for people to to understand that it's, it's become synonymous to a clean label per se so i think that's that's what it's it's predominantly how i would explain only thing is with as the de- demographics of a region changes uh, there is the demand goes up and down based on how much attention and how much demand of that is in the region so of course middle east probably is the highest but having said that i think indonesia and malaysia are equally as big like we are undergoing currently halal certification as we speak only so that we can export products to both indonesia and malaysia and as you rightly mentioned both actually have difference in in the way we do the certification so they have different bodies where they have uh, kind of given us you know the list of accreditation that we have to follow so there are nuances i mean this is per se as a global supply chain uh, and logistician i kind of feel that this is something we need to also come out with a common you know a, a norm where it makes it easier rather than doing country by country that's something i feel you know we should be also looking at yeah. yes it's an interesting challenge yeah? because what you yes. say um that i've experienced it as well what Absolutely. is necessarily halal in indonesia correct may not be seen as halal in malaysia correct or vice versa yes yeah? yes um so so you also mentioned just going off on a slight tangent yeah. some people see halal certification almost like a clean label absolutely yeah. so so is it your contention then that um when something is halal certified um it's perceived to have a higher value or higher quality 100% so i'll give you an example i mean imagine dates it's a natural fruit you go to a supermarket if i am a, if i if i am a, a new user yeah mm-hmm. i see four products on a shelf one of them is halal certified you know as as a as my basic intention would be you know what this would be better off than others just for the sake that it's halal certified even if i am a non muslim in my mind i will say that it has gone through at least that basic validation no cross contamination and so on and so forth i mean any process of certification obviously adds that little value so we we go through the whole organic certification we go through halal certification now it's it's com- becoming more like you know one of those mandatory uh, uh, or rather a certification when it comes to food that gives you that 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 confidence as a consumer so i definitely think it's a it's a higher perceived value for sure okay what do you think of that yoko yoko sai um having halal certification increases the the perceived value of the product that's very good example thank you very much kunai san that that is very interesting because uh in japan at as you may know that the halal is not so familiar yet to most of japanese consumers even though that some japanese people like me know about halal is clean so called clean label but uh the japanese people when they see the halal logo mark halal certification logo mark most of them most of them may feel oh this service and the product is not for me is not for the other people mm. because they don't know about halal exactly or in detail so that we are still uh, the, in the process the how to cater the halal certified food or halal friendly foods to japanese consumers that is why since um 2015 or 2016 i always 
give advice to Malaysian and Asian companies who are SMEs, food manufacturers, please do not promote halal so much. Please promote your product as Asian cuisine, Asian okay. makan. That would be better because as I mentioned, Japanese people, the consumers still don't know about the halal exactly. So the, yeah. this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, the actual Japanese uh, the market situation right now. Just amazing with what is uh, perception, yeah? So let me ask you, Michael, not so much as a supply chain expert, which you are, but as a consumer, you go to a supermarket and you want to buy dates, right? Very neutral product. I mean, it's whether they taste good or they don't. Mm. Um, so are you oriented towards buying dates that are halal certified if you see it on a shelf? I, I think the, it's a good question. Um, I, you know, when, when I buy food, I'm, um, I've changed my mind. I'm having a, a, an 11 year old daughter who educates me that it's important to buy biological, you know, organic, um, sustainable food. Um, and, and it, although that's not halal, it's, it's the same concept of looking for that label on the package that proves that that food has come from sustainable origins, that there's no, you know, unethical um, sort of employment, sort of child labor and things in, engaged that's come from sustainable means. Um, and that label certifies that, that that product is safe and, and, and authentic. And I think that's very much the same as the halal label. And yes, so when I do shop and I have three packets of dates, I will look for those, for those, uh, for those labels. It may um, call the fishing in the fishing industry. Obviously, there's been a lot of uh, news on the, on the uh, unsustainable fishing that's going on. And mm -hmm. so there's organizations around that, that say that this fish comes from sustainable fishing. You should support that rather than the other. So, yeah, uh, the, the branding right. is incredibly important. All right. Thank, thank, thanks for that, Michael. Sticking with you, Michael. So there's been a lot of focus, especially the last year with COVID, right? On pharma yeah. and uh, medical technology and medical devices and the medical whole medical supply chain and cold chain in particular. Has this also decreased or increased um, demand or focus on cold chain in halal certification or in other areas as well? So what's, what's happened, obviously, the focus has been on getting medical supplies to, to countries around the world, and a lot of the vaccines, obviously, the, the, the importance was given to vaccines. Um, they're almost 100% flown by, by, by air. But what's happened is, is there's been a massive chain sea freight and supply chain. Um, shipping companies have been caught off guard, not having enough containers because the whole chain, the, the whole supply chain has, has, has changed. There's been uh, also a large uh, increase in the um, demand of frozen food because countries are starting to stockpile food they didn't used to in the, in, in the past. There's been a change in consumer behavior because restaurants are closing. So generally households are now buying more refrigerators, buying more freezers, buying up on food in case of you know, the countries running out of supermarkets, running out of food. We've seen them across the world um, the toilet paper and ends up with 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 pasta you know people run out um so yes there has been a demand on the cold chain industry particularly reefer containers there's a shortage of reefer containers um operators driving reefer trucks and 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 having cold chain um centers depots have been you know um in in high demand so yeah it's the industry has seen a lot of a uh, lot of increase of demand Okay, so so perhaps for the other uh, gentlemen on the panel here, Kuma, Kunal, and Yokosan. So, where are the less you know cold chain and the opportunities for food products and production? Has this increased because of COVID? What are you seeing in your respective areas? Yeah, see for us. Yeah, I'll go Yokosan first. Yeah. All right, uh, definitely yeah. increase, uh, definitely increase. Uh, for example, they're looking at uh, the turnover of a logistic company called Yamato, which is uh, one of the largest logistic company in Japan. Black Cat. Uh, their turnover last year was 15% increase year on year, 1-5%. Of course, this 1-5% uh, looks like not so big, but actually very big 
because it uh, uh, the, their business based on the B two B, but now uh, the, as you know the B two B, mostly the suspended, stopped. So the consumer to consumer or the B two C, as well. So uh, the logistic the business and uh, I mean that especially because of the e commerce market growing up. That right. is why the, the, just, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, the brought the very big uh, the changes in Japan, okay. the even logistic market. Thanks, yoko -san. What about you, Kuna? What are you seeing? Yes. So actually in the Middle East, especially, say, I'll, I'll talk about specifically UAE. Now, 90% of our food is import. I mean, this is not a country where the weather permits a lot of production especially the fresh produce and all. So it's, it's mostly been flown in from Europe and other parts of the world. So with COVID, the scenario kind of, it was like a two-edged sword. What happened, how UAE operates, you always have three, four, five months of supply in the country. You have another two, three months of supply always in transit from somewhere or the other. You know, so that six months of inventory is built pipeline. And then you, you have... Uh, some orders which are already placed with the vendors for manufacturing. Now, last year, all this kind of, uh, you know, it just suddenly came to a halt. A lot of restaurants were closed and the country was obviously under lockdown, which led to a lot of wastage of food in the country for sure. But then immediately, the good thing in UAE is it bounced back very quickly. I mean, we were also among the first country to be fully open. So by end of summer like early winter last year october november we saw probably a peak which was bigger than 2019 in the food industry everybody wanted to come out they wanted to eat out and then the restaurants suddenly boomed i think december 2020 was better than december 2019 for most businesses in ua so then the, again there was a spike and irrespective of the freight prices like michael said going over the roof there is not much of an option. There was a whole refill that happened in the country. So it led to a huge spike in terms of, again, those containers flowing in. So somehow UAE being that a country that depends so much on import, the food uh, demand has been extremely high. And with, with the prices hitting the roof now, it's just not helping actually. It's become two, three times from pretty much most of the sectors. Well, thank, thanks, thanks for that, Kunal. Thanks, Yoko, sir. So, you know, we, of course, we know some of the more obvious differences when it comes to cold chain logistics, right? Uh, temperature excursions, for example, we want to maintain that, that consistency throughout the, the entire shipment of that product. Yeah? Um, but what are some of the less obvious differences between cold chain versus normal logistics? For those of us in the audience who are not so familiar with this space, what are some of the less obvious things? Michael, maybe you want to start? In, in terms of, of, of cold chain, I mean, obviously, um, when we look at um, uh, the, the agricultural sector, um, they, they recommend or they, 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 we think that there's at least um, six to eight parties, different parties from farm to fork. So that's six different companies actually involved in moving um, food. Um, so un unless you've got, you know, first of all, visibility o over, the, over those continuous partners and then a, a, a sort of interconnected um, supply chain management system, visibility platform, it's very difficult to know which party is holding it. So as you pass the baton, do you know that the previous company actually kept your food at the right temperature and everything else? Um, you know, the, the, the other thing uh, is about food safety. Uh, how do you know that your food not only is being kept in the right temperature to maintain its, 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 its quality, but do you know that anyone's tampering with it? You know, um, counterfeit um, halal food has been out there for many, many years. We've recently had a, a scandal in Malaysia with imported beef that wasn't actually in, beef itself. It was, it was applied with fake labels. So I think, you know, it's not just the, the, the coal chain that's important about the basic food, it's the security, it's making sure that there's, there's a, 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 um, a very secure um, chain of custody from, from, from far, farm to fork. That's, so so that's, an, increase, uh, that's, an increase, it's more important 
what you're saying is more important in the in your food supply chain to have that tracking and traceability and keeping the that the pureness or the originality of the product. Yeah, uh, ab- sure absolutely. Okay, yeah, interesting. And, yeah. And that, and that can be helped with technology, really with, with real-time visibility of companies such as ourselves. But there are companies out there that are blockchain, really, really encrypted end to chain where from, from the manufacturer, from the factory to the restaurant, to the supermarket, where the consumer can actually scan the product with an app and see, you know, is that the real product? Serialization, really important. The farmer industry has been doing this for, for years. The food industry has to catch up. Well, well here's then a bit of uh, going off on a slight tangent here. You mentioned blockchain technology. I'm not sure if you had the chance to hear Marco uh, when he delivered the keynote. Um, and one of the things he said, or one of my takeaways from his uh, presentation was, um, is blockchain technology perhaps really even necessary for many parts of the supply chain, or even in the food supply chain in this case. Well, what do you think, panelists? Well, I, I think taking on from what Michael said, and Michael, I've actually used some Rombi products uh, as, a, as a trial <laughs> and done. So, I mean, that's that's the, the, the beginning of it, you know, that's the start of it. I mean, to get such a beautiful IoT device, which can travel across boundaries and and like i said i mean same example take a farmer in europe man i mean there are there are lettuces that we buy most of them are actually uh, produced out of netherlands now now if that lettuce has a label which is you know iot enabled so i know that when it's traveling from netherlands to uae the whole journey has the data stored and if at every touch point like you said there are at least six parties touching changing hands for the products if each of them puts in their information either into that device or onto the blockchain imagine as a consumer walking into a supermarket with your phone just scanning that label and it shows you you are buying this lettuce which was produced 3 days back in this farm in netherland and then it it shows you all those tick steps changing hands gives that amount of confidence what you are eating i think like michael all of us with with our kids growing up they are bringing more awareness you know than than that than from our growing up times where where label was never an important you look at the product and eat it you know now it's the label has become more important than the food so i think with that coming in i definitely feel without technology it's just not possible i mean it's just not going to be with with the whole globalization how how do you keep a track so definitely blockchain is the way to go within supply chain of course the question of affordability remains i mean thanks to rombi you have made iot affordable so <laughs> but <laughs> michael I have get to see blockchain affordable so yeah. yeah michael you need to hire kunal i mean it could <laughs> be a way. better plug for your company he's mentioned <laughs> rombi twice in one breath yes. and, and yes. this wasn't prearranged so thank yes. you kunal yeah, thank yeah, you yeah. <laughs> so definitely wasn't prearranged in fact i think you gentlemen just met just before we start oh yeah i i didn't know michael i i mean i have high regards <laughs> so i i know their owners so it's it's been really a good good start yes absolutely yeah, seriously i mean you could have planned it better michael <laughs> well um moving on yeah so we've talked a bit about the uh, challenges in coaching logistics maybe we look at it because you know with the diversity um yoko san you're in japan you've got a lot of asian experience obviously um kunal you're from India originally, but based in Dubai, yeah. Um, and Michael, of course, um, you're practically Singaporean. You've been here for what 22 years now. So, right. what are some of the opportunities by geography, product, and uh, mode, or other areas? Really, if if I was a business owner, if I was a logistics company, yeah, either one or the other, where do you see some of the opportunities, um, Yoko San? Okay, uh, I'd like to talk about the two points. One is the product. Okay, a uh, plant-based product. I'm very, very keen, the most at at moment. The second one is investment opportunity. If we talk about Japan, I would like you to uh, keen to look at the cold and chilled uh, the facility to invest. Here in Japan, because it, according to some research, 20 of children called logistic facilities in Japan are more than 40 years old. 
So now is the time to renovate. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. So if I'm a REIT or a, a real estate in, um, developer, look at investing in cold chain in Japan, yeah? Yes, please. And plant-based products. Okay, interesting. Thank, thanks, Yokosa. What about yourself, Kunal? What, what would you say? So I would say more of uh, the sustainable means of growing food. Uh, and that's been uh, something which is on a very, very high uh, importance and radar in UAE. So the whole, uh, basically, hydroponics and vertical farming. That's that's the way to go. And again, uh, going back to uh, Netherlands, probably they are among the pioneers in making sure it's not only just hydroponics and sustainability. It's about use of technology now in the food industry. Now, whether use of that technology is to make that a lab grown meat as you call as you know the plant based i mean I, yes. I know singapore has been pioneer in that and they're trying to do that as well so I, I, yes i mean the way we are going away I, I always use this my favorite example uh we will be touching almost 10 million people uh, by 2050 you know and in next 30 years we need the amount of food to be grown on this planet, which we have not done in last eight centuries. So that gives an idea of what is the kind of the, the you know, the, the, the tension we are putting on the resources that we have on the planet. So I think the whole idea is how we can grow more food to feed everybody on earth more sustainably. I think that's probably the biggest key takeaway for me that we should be looking at. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. And yourself, self, Michael. Well, I think very, very much to the point of, of, of Kunal, I think um, sustainable food, you know, let, let's buy local, grow local. We've seen that the difficulties during the COVID that, that supply chain is dis disrupted overnight. Um, airlines shut down, shipping companies scramble. You know, I, I think countries can start looking at producing not only their own pharmaceuticals, but their own food in the local market. Singapore's trying the 30-30, 30% of the food by 2030. As as can also sell hydroponics, um, we should probably all eat less as well. I, I think <laughs> that's something that we we, we we've benefit from. Point, Michael. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the other point to to um, Yokosan's um, on infrastructure, the, um, the you know the vaccination program that we see ongoing around the world now is not going to end. It's going to continue. There'll be boosters. There'll be on, ongoing. So the infrastructure that that has been put up there has to be um, sustainable and secure. Um, UNICEF did a study recently where they found that over 300 facilities in Asia uh, are basically, again, over 20 years old and need upgrading in terms of storage facilities, logistics, uh, supply chain, everything else. So there's opportunities in, in that space as well. All right. I've just been prompted by the, the guys in the back saying that we're out of time. So in the interest of time, Quick 30-second takeaway, you know, um, the panel is on coaching and the opportunities for halal certified food products and production. Quick 30 seconds, Kuna, what, what are your parting words to the audience? I think I'll, I'll just summarize what I've been saying, that uh, we should be looking at halal as more like a clean label. You know, I, it, there should be a little more understanding and knowledge to what halal certification means i think that's a little less prevalent in all part of world like yokosan said it's, it's just not a certificate only for muslims i mean it it is if anything it's more inclusive rather than exclusive so that's my only giveaway to the audience that you know you shouldn't be looking at it as something that if i am not a muslim i'm not going to eat halal it's it's right. more of a the awareness that I'd like to drive that it's it's a very clean label kind of a product. So Thank whether it's a meat, non-meat, we should be looking at that. That's Thank you, Kuno. And yourself, Yoko san. Okay. Um my message is uh the respect others and enjoy diversity. Well oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Thanks, Yoko san. <laughs> is it okay? And Michael? It it has to be technology. Technology never have we seen such so much power in the hands of the consumer? And if you if you bring that power of choice that the consumer has that drives business today and the add-on technology where they can actually authenticate the product that they pick up in the supermarket, that's very powerful. So, you know, bring on the technology. Let's make sure that we can keep the uh, the, the, the bad guys out of the market. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Michael uh, from Germany, Yoko-san in Japan, and Kunal in Dubai. 
great panel session and thank you very much for your participation today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. You've been a great host. Thank you thank very you much. So much. Thank, thank you. Very much. Much.